All right, uh, so to start, uh, I'm Greg File. I work at a company called Formation uh, based in San Francisco. We do, uh, I think we're calling it hyper-personalization currently, uh, recommendation systems like Amazon-ish for companies that, don't, that aren't Amazon. Um, uh, I work with Ross Baker, who is giving a talk later today. Uh, some of you may be familiar with his work. Uh, also, Chris Medico and Paul Snively, a lot of like great Scala people. We do Scala and Haskell there. Um, and uh, this stuff is not work-related. Um, but it is a great place for me to like learn about these things with a lot of great people I work with. So we're hiring. If anybody's interested in talking to me, we do remote, I think I mentioned already. Uh, I live in Colorado myself, um, so please come talk to me. Um, so this talk is online already uh, in, I think, unedited from what I'm showing right now uh, at that URL. Um, there's a Scala library I called Cheshire, um, as, which kind of gives a, you know, better representation of a lot of these things. It's all stripped down from the slides, but uh, that library tries to model all this stuff. And then a similar library in a different language called DAL, which probably no one's familiar with, but uh, it does these same kind of things in that language. Um, so it's kind of sister libraries. Uh, so this is a literate uh, Scala talk. So all these slides compile. Uh, this is the build.sbt. Uh, I actually don't think it needs the type level compiler anymore. When I started working on this, it did. I think I've stripped out everything that actually uses it, so maybe it would work with the uh, standard 2.12. Uh, it uses higher kinds, uh, which is something that comes up a lot in the FP world. Um, hopefully it's, um, you know, will be obvious enough when we get to it. Uh, and depends on cats and spire. And uh, it also uses kind projector. Uh, who's not familiar with kind projector as a uh, extension? So kind projector is a way that you can basically um, partially apply type constructors. Uh, I wanna, when we first get to an example that has it, I'll make a point of, of showing how that works. Um, but it's a very useful library in kind of type level stuff. Just, it's almost like required in, in everything, in cats and everything like that. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, it might be in, like, very enlightening when we get there. So this is everything that's required. Um, and so you know, this talk is called the Monoyad, uh, which is a reference to uh, you know, things like the Iliad, epic poems. Uh, and so epic poems often begin in the middle of things, just kind of giving a little background on what those are. And there's a cyclic journey where we start somewhere, explore some things, and then end up back home again. Um, they cover a vast landscape of, you know, of exploration and stuff like that, and so hopefully you'll get a sense of that uh, today as well. Uh, they're also written in a uh, dactylic hexameter. Um, this talk is not in that, it's in a, so there's, there's no poetry, so you'll uh, hopefully appreciate the lack of it. Um, and also, there's usually a descent into hell, uh, which, uh, well, that's probably going to happen, so uh, we'll see. So yeah, the monoid, uh, it's kind of a mashup of a few words. Uh, monoids, which is really the center of this talk, um, which there's a definition here that is hopefully, or not hopefully, but maybe not meaningful yet, but we'll get to that. Uh, this add suffix is usually um, a common thing in epic poems to, to label them as such. So this is a poem about monoids. And finally, a monad is also, this title originated as a typo, uh, I don't remember if the original was monoid or monad, but it's one of those two, um, and it kind of was inspirational, uh, inspirational typo. And so we'll talk about how monads relate to monoids as well in this. So what is a monoid? Uh, who's not familiar with monoids? Great, this is a good start. Um, so in abstract algebra, and the way you've probably seen it in cats or other things like that, is a monoid looks very much like this. Uh, the names of these definitions are probably different. I forget, I think they're called combine. And, maybe identity, I don't know, in, in, uh, um, in cats, but here we call them product and unit. And so what a mon monoid has is a product that takes you know, two values of type A and somehow combines them to give you a new value of type A. And it also gives you a way to get some, you know, some special value of type A um, out of it. And so this is, again, the definition that, that you've probably seen if you looked at cats or Scala Z or uh, any kind of FP library anywhere. Um, but there's actually more to a monoid than these things, right? So, um, these abstract or these algebraic structures have uh, have laws associated with them, uh, and these are the laws for uh, for the monoids or for monoids. Um, the first one is associativity, right? So it basically you can look at the implementation here is saying that like if you have a product x and y and take the product of the result of that with z, that's the same as if you take the product of x with the product of y and z, right? So that that being able to reassociate how you combine things um, has to you know, those two things have to have the same result. Uh, and then there's identity laws that talk about how that unit value interacts with other, other values. So you have a left and right identity, meaning if you combine that unit with, you know, if you make a product out of that either way, 
uh, you still end up with the original x value. So it can't change the thing. Um, so these are the laws that are associated with that. Um, and I, I put fold here at the bottom just as a, you know, fold is kind of a um, specialization of fold left to where you use the unit as your zero value and the product as your, your way to combine things, or fold right actually. Oh, I chose fold left because fold right uses a val, and that's a little, little wild. Um, so yeah, so, um, so let's get into some examples of monoids. Um, I think uh, if people are familiar, we might move through this part a little quickly, but um, so there's, a couple, there's two here for, for Booleans that are very common. One is conjunction, uh, where you, you know, take a and an, b uh, as the combiner, and then true is the unit, right? So if you have uh, the unit and false, true and false is still false, so you maintain that original thing. Um, disjunction is kind of the reverse of that, where you combine them with or, Right, so A or B, and in that case, the unit is false, because if you have false or true, you still get that true, right? So false, no matter what you combine it with, will give you the other value. Um, so this is, and in, you know, in the comments there, I have some kind of examples of, of those things written out. Um, and these things show up everywhere. In, uh, with integers, there's, you know, additive and multiplicative with addition and zero. These are ones you're probably familiar with from, what is that, first grade, second grade? Um, you know, so you can add zero to things. You can multiply things by, by one, uh, stays the same. You know, these are very basic operations. Um, but there's even more uh, for integers. Uh, we can like, uh, so join is like the max of two things. Um, and then the, the unit is the min value. So if you take the max of the lowest value you can get and some other value, you'll get that other value back. And again, the reverse of that is this uh, meet, which takes the minimum of two values and its unit is the, is the max. And finally, uh, last example is just concatenation. Um, one of the things I like about concatenation versus the other ones uh, is that this one's not commutative, right? A lot of the examples of monoids that come up are uh, commutative, which means you can reverse the order of A and B and it doesn't change the result. Um, but with string concatenation, if you were to do B plus plus A, you know, that could be a very different value than A plus plus B. And you can uh, concatenate the empty string with anything to, you know, get the same value back. So hopefully that, you know, uh, gives us a very, you know, familiar thing here um, or like helps re-familiarize us with, with what a monoid is in, in our day to day. And so why do we care about monoids? Um, one thing is that it's, it's something that exists outside of a programming language or things like that, right? It's not just like here is, um, you know, something we've, we've built within our particular programming paradigm or programming uh, language, uh, you know, constructs, but, but something we can think about more abstractly. Um, and monoids also give us kind of a sweet spot, as we'll see as we, we go through, where there's a sufficient level of expressivity in them, uh, and they're restricted enough that, um, that they actually pop up all over the place, and uh, see how that works. And concurrency is a, a third thing, actually, um, just as a little bit of a practicality thing. Uh, associativity is kind of how we get the ability to, like, parallelize things, right? Like, if we see that things can be, like, smaller parts of it can be done in different, like, independently of each other, we can split those things into parallel processes. So, so knowing that things are associative uh, in particular is, is very uh, practical. So let's generalize this a little bit. Um, to start generalizing this, in the earlier examples, I had like equality for the laws, right? Saying that this value has to be equal to that value. Uh, when we generalize, we have to talk a little bit, uh, weaken that a little bit to isomorphism. Um, and so whereas with equality, we just say these two things are the same. With isomorphism, we say that we have a way to get from one thing to the other and a way to get back to that initial value, right? So there, um, and here's an example where we can transform between a string and a list of characters. Uh, and we can see that, you know, those two values at the bottom are not the same, right? Um, but they are isomorphic. We can convert to one and convert back to the other. There's no lossiness in there. And, um, and so, you know, we have this weaker notion of isomorphism that, that works um, to give us laws in, in broader context than, than equality would force us to. So, um, this is very important. We, I actually try to avoid talking about isomorphisms specifically, but you'll see basically functions. Like I often define the A to B without doing the inverse, uh, just with like implying that the, the inverse also exists. Um, so let's go back to our uh, definition here, right? Here's the, the monoid uh, implementation or uh, definition with its laws, right? It's where we started at kind of. So now we can lift this to the type level. Now we're going to take a minute to look at this. Um, so let's look at product. Product is a, um, let's see here, product is a type constructor, right? It takes two parameters. Uh, and so just as product at the 
um, you know, in the normal type class or, or trait here, um, takes two parameters. Right? The type is also a type that takes two parameters. So you can think of that type constructor, I think you should often think of type constructors as functions that take types and return types. Right? So this is actually a function that takes a tuple of two types. Right? There's two type parameters in there. And the result of that is some new type. Uh, identity is a type itself, just as we saw here, like unit is you know, some, some value. Um, and so, so can you see how these things parallel? So that the names, unfortunately, are different. I use unit in the lowercase one um, because there's a lowercase identity already. And I use identity in the capital one because um, there's an uppercase unit already. Um, so they don't match up in here, but I, I was hoping that that was more clear than trying to like overload the, the meanings that are in your head somewhere. I don't know. Um, so anyway, so, right, we, we, so we can tr translate that structure and see how those product and identity match. Uh, and then if we look at the laws here, here we have an implementation of a function right, that says product of product of this is equal to uh, that product, or that combination of products. Well, here we define it at the type level where if we take a product of this product, right, and again, it's all the same, same structure, right? We can see here we've defined the value, basically, the expression, and here we've defined a type. Uh, and so, and again, this is where there would be isomorphism, but here I'm just using a function. You actually need to go both ways um, to get that approximation of equality. Uh, and again, the same thing for the identities. Now, the neat thing here is where to actually like show that your instance for this is correct, you need to like write some property test somewhere, right? That actually makes sure that these things are always true, right? And so you would like, you make a new monoid instance and you like run a set of property tests against it so that make sure that those things are never false. And you're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a, a good instance. Um, but actually, at the type level, implementing this function is your proof. Like it's an actual proof. It's not just like, um, you know, I need to like do property tests or anything like that. If you can implement this actually isomorphism, um, that is a proof that your, that this definition of a, of a type level monoid is actually, is actually valid and correct. So I feel like that's pretty cool that you can actually, you know, your implementation is a proof. So is this slide clear to people? Does anybody want to, I, I can answer questions on it right now because this is kind of fundamental to everything else that comes after. Okay. So um, we'll, we'll get a couple instances out of this. So uh, our first example is the Cartesian monoid um, where the product is tuple and the identity is unit. And here's um, implementation of that where we have some nested tuple here, right? And we restructure it into one that builds up the uh, A and then B and C, right? So that's the proof of associativity. Again, has to be both directions. Didn't implement that uh, for this talk. Uh, and then for identities, we have to show that we can uh, extract the A out of the product. Um, and also we have to make sure that like, given an A, we can actually build that product back up. And the same for the right identity. So this is called the Cartesian monoid. It um, hopefully is fairly simple. Uh, now there's another one, a monoid at the type level, called the co-Cartesian. Uh, co is a common prefix on things. Um, and, uh, and with this one, the product is actually either, which is like a little weird because that's a co-product, but um, names get fuzzy. Um, but yeah, so we have either A or B, and the identity is actually nothing, right? Uh, so we can show, again, I hear the proofs aren't implemented, but if you have a nested either, you have one of these three values, and you can build up one of those three values nested inside the either structure just by mixing lefts and rights, depending on where your thing is. So uh, hopefully that's obvious without the implementation. Uh, for the identities, it's, it's interesting here, because you have either nothing or A, but how, if you have an either, can you always get the right side out of it? Well, the fact that the left side is nothing so that there's no way you can ever have a value that's left, right? So if you have a value of this type, it has to be right. And so you can just unwrap it from the right and there's, there's no way to have the, the left value in there. And the same for the right identity. Here you're required to have um, a left because having a right would require you to have a value of type nothing, which is impossible. I hope that's impossible in Scala, right? I mean, let's get a little shaky on these things sometimes. Um, so now we have two different instances of this, this type level monoid. Um, all right, so that's, that's all kind of the abstract algebra notion of monoids. Um, hopefully not too unfamiliar to, to most of you. Uh, the type level stuff's a little different view of it, but um, hopefully still makes some sense. Uh, so now we'll talk about what it means to be a monoid in category theory, which is a much more general, general notion. Um, so first we'll talk about what a category is. Um, so a category has some, has some objects, uh, which in the cases here we'll talk about are the objects are types. 
Uh, and it has arrows between objects, which is that type parameter up there, uh, which hopefully looks distinct enough from the normal function arrow, but it's meant to evoke uh, the notion of an arrow. Uh, that takes two types, right, the source and destination. Uh, and of course, the result of that is a new type. Um, and then so a category, you have to be able to compose things. So this takes two functions, or two arrows, I should say, more general. Uh, and then the result has to be a, a new arrow from A to C. So if you have an arrow from A to B and an arrow from B to C, you can compose them and get one from A to C. And there's also an identity um, for any type um, or any object. You have to be able to apply the identity arrow, which gives you back that same object. Um, and the common case of this is set, uh, often called Skull or Hask or things like that to blur some because um, they're not exactly set for various reasons, um, but we can think of it as set. And so this common category that we use is where we actually just use the function arrow as the arrow. So you can see here, compose and identity are um, what we think of as like normal definitions for these things, right? Where actually a function B to C and a function A to B can be combined to give you a function A to C. And identity is the identity function. So, uh, uh, while set is the thing that we work with all the time in programming, basically, uh, there are lots of other categories. And the term monoid, um, well, the history of it is a little fuzzy, but one of the interpretations of the, uh, of the term monoid is uh, mon, mono means one, oid means thing, object, whatever. So it's a category with one object, uh, which is kind of a weird way of thinking about it, where the, the values of a type you can think of are the arrows instead of being objects themselves. Uh, and then, uh, and then it's composition that is the, um, um, that is whatever your operation is on the type, uh, your monoidal operation. So like if you have plus, uh, you, you add things by composing two of the arrows. So you can do like 12 plus 13 by composing those two arrows, and you now have 25. Uh, and then you have some special value, which is marked as E here, uh, which would be your identity for the arrow for that, um, for that object, uh, which for addition would be zero. But this is, this is kind of, a, I guess, useful to be familiar with, but, but I don't feel like it's very useful in practice. There's a different notion of a monoid object in a monoidal category. And this is what we'll kind of uh, be talking about here and what's actually useful when writing Scala or, or other things. Um, so as we saw earlier, here's what a monoid looks like. I dropped the laws for the moment. Um, we can do some changes here to make it feel more categorical. So even though categories have objects and arrows, the, you, Objects are not really a thing you deal with, right? Like we talked about, there's co composition and identity. Both of those things are arrows. The only things you can do is like combine arrows basically in different ways, and you never actually have objects to deal with. Um, and, uh, and so in getting to that, we have to kind of get away from things like, like this unit here, which is just like a value. We can't model that categorically really. So we can, we can kind of defer it and do this kind of arrow where we just, you know, unit only takes one value. So it's isomorphic to just being A, uh, but we've now turned it into an arrow that we can deal with. And we can do the same thing with product. Uh, it's a method right now. Um, we can make a little change to make it a, a function um, from a tuple to an A, right? So now we have two arrows to deal with. Uh, and so this is, you know, this is, I hope uh, people can see this is still the same definition of, of monoid, right? Like we've just switched between functions and, and or methods and functions and, and deferred the unit, uh, but it's the same thing. So this actually looks very similar to something we defined at the type level where we have a product is tuple, and then the product of monoid starts from a tuple, and the, uh, the identity object in the Cartesian is unit, and in our uh, monoid unit, uh, the function is from unit. So now we have a way to generalize this notion of an abstract algebraic um, monoid to a category theoretic monoid. Uh, so we can, instead of just, just defining monoid specifically for tuples and unit, we can parameterize it. So if we look at this first thing here, we now have um, some type level monoid passes a parameter. And so instead of explicitly having a tuple for the product here, right, we now have whatever the product is in that type level monoid is used as our product here. If we use Cartesian, uh, let's look at this first example, we use Cartesian as a thing, that's the one that has unit or tuple and unit, we get back the same definition we had before, where we go from a pair of Booleans to a Booleans, uh, to a Boolean, and we, where we end up with a, a Boolean from the unit. Right, and so we have the product there. Oops. Wow, okay, I don't know what it is there. Yes. Um, okay, so, uh, so yeah, so now we go from whatever the product is in that monoid and whatever the identity is in that monoid uh, to a value of, of type A. Uh, and then so again, now we can define an instance 
of mo uh, we can specialize monoid to co-Cartesian, which now gives us a way to, to have these product definitions from if you have either A or A to A, and uh, I guess it's off the screen here, if you have a unit, um, it gives you, it's the identity operation because nothing is a subtype of everything else. So, you know, you can get an A back. But you can never call that function because you can never actually apply an identity or apply a, a, a function to nothing. And, um, and that's called absurd, which is actually a useful function despite its name and lack of ability to be called. Um, <laughs> so let's go back and uh, look at categories a little bit here. So it just, you know, showed that, that monoid thing, but we didn't have any laws for it. Um, so we, we take our, um, unfortunately, there's a little bit of, of a twist here for, for Scala in this. Here we have this, uh, this arrow being um, uh, universally quantified, right, a type parameter. Um, but because of some encoding stuff in Scala, uh, to actually use it the way I want to use it, we actually have to turn it into an existential or a type member there. So we have the arrow and the product and the identity. So this arrow is the same as that uh, long arrow glyph. Um, so this kind of goes through the same thing here. Now we can specialize this to a monoidal category, uh, which gives us a little bit more generality. Before, let's go back a couple slides, right? We had this product and identity, but we still had these function arrows fixed in here, right? So we're still limited to things that were um, uh, basically in set, where the arrows are functions. And so now with this monoidal category, we've abstracted over the arrow as well. And so we can go from some product, right? Whatever the product in the monoidal category is, um, and, uh, you know, and use the arrow to get to, to an A. And the same, we can create a value going through the arrow for that thing. So this is, this is where we start abstracting over and really get use out of that notion of you know, deferring the unit and stuff like that. So, um, so now this is, this is pretty abstract, right? There's like nothing in there. All that's there is an A. Uh, <laughs> you have to work in a category. Uh, so now these both Cartesian and co-Cartesian still both use um, the function arrow as their arrow. But we can look at them again. They look, again, the same as the definition we just saw, um, since arrow is specialized to the function arrow in those cases. Uh, but there are other monoidal categories that, that give us, um, that doing this level of abstraction where we have the notion of product, identity, and arrow all at the type level uh, gives us some flexibility. For example, there's what's called opposite categories. Um, and so, given some monoidal category, you can get what's called the opposite or dual category for that. Uh, and all that it does is switch the source and target of the arrows, right? So where it was arrow A, B, um, you know, in the source category, we, we swapped them, so now we have arrow B to A. Um, and so it reverses all the arrows in the category. And this gives us some useful things. Um, co is a, is a prefix that shows up all the time. It often means dual things. So there's a notion of a co-monoid, which is right here, um, and which is the opposite of the Cartesian monoid. And what that means is the type of this, you know, once you've applied this particular monoidal category to it, the type you have is now instead of product to A, it's now A to product, right? And instead of unit to A, it's now A to unit. Now this doesn't come up a lot in Scala actually in practice because you can implement this as you can see here for all A, right? There's nothing interesting about it. These are just two functions you can apply to anything. Um, but in things like linear uh, type systems and stuff like that, this actually becomes useful. In Stephanie's talk this morning, um, I forget the name of the type that was there, but there was the, um, the request something to, to one, and that is an example of the comanetic, uh, sorry, comanoidal uh, unit. And so in, in her linear, uh, um, linear session types work stuff, like this actually does come up and is very useful. And it, it will be useful in Scala, or it's in useful in Scala in other, in other contexts as well. Um, so we can apply the same thing to type constructors, um, where instead of the these things being just regular types, they can be type constructors themselves, right? Um, and this allows us to abstract to things like uh, monads uh, instead of just type level, um, instead of just monoids uh, as we define them usually in Scala. Um, and, and so there's an extension for Scala C called uh, kind polymorphism. Still a little, has some rough edges, um, but that would allow you to actually unify these things, this T monoid and T monoid F F being for functor, um, which is what we often call type constructors of the shape. Um, and you can specialize this actually to monad, where monad is a, a monoid over type constructors uh, with, a specific, um, with a specific product, where that product is actually um, nested, uh, which is like composition. So nested F, G, A is actually just a way of partially applying F of G of A. 
Uh, but there's way too many of these things, right? Like here's just two instances that you can create for like arbitrary types. As long as there's a quality instance, you can kind of pick any value as the unit and define this as a way that like you can kind of always pick the first or second th element of a pair. Um, so they don't work very well like in the FP way we think of a type classes, right? Because uh, as we saw at the beginning, there was like four different instances for integer. Here's two more that could be applied. Well, even more than two more because it's uh, scaled by the cardinality of the set itself. Um, so there's way too many monoids. Um, and so in practice, how do we like get down to the ones we care about? Well, one thing is, is that they're part of this hierarchy of, of various uh, algebraic structures. And so you can often find additional properties that relate to your particular um, monoid. And, uh, and you can decide among different ones which one seems like you know, the strongest or the, the most useful uh, in your case and kind of take that instance. Uh, that's kind of uh, not my favorite approach. Uh, another thing that's common in Scala and Haskell is to rename these things. Um, although at the time they probably weren't thought of as renaming them. But like monad, uh, which is, can be a monoid if you use kind polymorphism. Uh, the alternative type class could be a monoid if you use something like um, where you can quantify um, some constraints. So skip over what that is. Uh, and comonoid, where we specialize to a different category. Uh, so all these things could just be defined as monoid, but giving them these different names, uh, there's a trade-off there as well, where we, uh, when we try to use these things specifically, it means we eliminated the ability to use other instances, but, um, um, but we do get the ability to define instances, multiple instances for a type that don't conflict with each other. And finally, there's different ways to relate monoids um, that, that are very useful. Um, one is a rig. Uh, are people familiar with the notion of a ring? So a, ri a rig is a kind of a punny name that is a ring without negation. So there's no subtraction, which is good because negative types are hard. Um, but, uh, and so, so there's ways of relating these things where you have an additive monoid and a multiplicative monoid, right? And so you have these two monoids that have some relationship to each other. And again, they have laws. In this case, the laws are distributivity. Um, so you, know, you can multiply A by the sum of B and C. And I said sum, even though you know it's like a typeable addition. Uh, but this is exactly the, the mathematical law, mathematical laws you learned in like algebra in high school, right, or middle school, or I don't know what. Um, but uh, but they're now generalized over types, and we, we can say how these things relate to each other. Uh, and so set is actually a rig category where that either that co-Cartesian monoid is the additive one, uh, and the uh, and the Cartesian monoid is the multiplicative one. Um, and we often talk about right co-products as being like a sum type and. Uh, and tuples as being like a product type. And so those, those metaphors aren't just metaphors. Like they actually work um, this way. Um, oh, that didn't fit. Um, there's lattices, which kind of are like rigs, but they actually go both ways. So you can distribute either over the other. They're completely invertible. So you can swap the two monoids. So here we call them meet and join. But you can actually pull one out that it reverses join and meet. Duoids is something that nobody ever talks about. It relates to things uh, in ways that people get frustrated about all the time, but nobody like, takes this approach to fixing it, um, which is like the relationship between applicative and monad. Uh, and more specifically, um, and so here are the laws related to, to duoids. Uh, but they, so they, this is, shows the relationship between um, uh, right here. Um, the relationship between applicatives and monads. Sorry, I know it's not very obvious, but it's, it's a thing. And then, uh, and then also the relationship between parallel and sequential applicatives, right? This comes up all the time, because we were like, oh, validation versus either, like switching these types. Those are just two instances of monoid on the same type. Um, and being able to like represent a duoid gives you a way to kind of swap between them and like handle both parallel composition as well as the sequential stepping. Um, with one type without having to convert back and forth between them, which seems to be the common way to, to deal with them. Uh, and there's also, also these, uh, these graph, model, this, these graph uh, representations that, that I represent with duoids. It's a really cool concept that I feel like has, I mean, I've only learned about it like a month ago. Um, and uh, there's just been recently a few papers written on the topic. Uh, I feel like they're hopefully something that will help clarify a bunch of ideas that have been a bit messy in FP. And there's lots of other ways to combine these things. Um, that give you bigger structures that have, again, these laws that relate them properly to one another. Uh, and the last thing, <laughs> to get back to things, is uh, we talked about categories actually earlier, right? And how a monoid is a one object category. Well, it turns out a category is actually a monoid. If you squint a little bit, you can see it right here, right? It takes two 
things and returns a thing, and this takes two functions and returns a function, and then there's some special function that is the identity, right? So a category is itself a monoid, and a monoid is a specific kind of category. So this is that, that kind of circular um, thing there. And, and here, there's a little bit of trick to make it actually work, but I'll get over that. And uh, okay, that's a lot of stuff. Um, wrap it up here, and uh, these are people I would like to thank for all their work uh, in related areas, and then if you wanna read some stuff about this. That's it, thanks. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. We have time for two or three questions. I have the mic if you... Uh, just really simple. Um, when you're doing a Haskell, are you just using all type families instead of the, uh, the hash? And... Uh, so I end up using uh, associated types in, uh, in a type class. Okay. I've been calling them kind classes, okay. but there's, yeah. Also, this is much harder to do in Haskell, just for people who are on that Scala-Haskell divide of things. It ta it's, uh, it's a mess. Um. Anybody else? Calling once. There. Um, you talked about uh, kind polymorphism. Um, were there any other features you wish Scala had or that made this particularly challenging to encode? Um, so kind of polymorphism is definitely one. Um, yeah, I mean, what I don't see coming anytime soon is kind of universe polymorphism, um, being able to abstract between types and kinds, which is like when we see those type, you know, types with like constructors, those are different kinds. Um, so you can abstract over types, kinds, sorts, and other things like that. You get this whole tower of universes to abstract over. Uh, things like languages like Agda have that, and it makes this kind of thing uh, much more transparent. Anybody else? Oh, we have one. Eric's here. <laughs> um, so I noticed in, at least in one case, you sort of mentioned you moved a type perimeter into a type member to make the encoding work better in Scala. I was wondering, for this kind of problem, it almost looked to me like maybe you could have moved most of the type parameters into type members. Is that something you explored? Because because like in certain cases, like I know in Dottie, the like, hash notation for type projection is not really going to be supported in general, but like it seemed like in most of those cases, if you had a value of the kind of underlying th category, you could have then used, uh, you know, like the t projected out the type members, which would still be sound. And so do you think that would have helped the encoding or not? So that's actually a good point. Um, uh, that, might, that might be. I've definitely struggled with some of the, um, getting the exact semantics I went out of some things. Some things are a little fuzzier than I'd like, and I don't, you know, know all the edges of the Scala language that well. Uh, I've, I've been kind of, um, you know, sheltered in the FP world of Scala that like understanding Scala C and stuff like that hasn't been something I've been good at. Um, so I think that there are better ways to encode some of this stuff and this Cheshire library, which is the Scala one up there, um, you know, tries to do some things, but I would love to talk to anybody who can help me fix some of those encoding problems. And I don't think they're like crazy category theory problems, they're like understanding how Scala works problems. Um, so I could definitely use help with that. Thank you so much, Greg, for the wonderful talk.